The next item of business is a debate on motion 5655 in the name of Gillian Martin on the seat belts on School Transport Scotland Bill at Stage 1. Can I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons, please? And I call on Gillian Martin, who is the member in charge of the bill, to speak to and move the motion. Up to 13 minutes, please, Ms Martin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to open today's debate on the general principles of the seat belts and School Transport Scotland Bill. These measures follow the devolution of competence and it's particularly heartening to be able to bring legislative proposals to the Chamber which take forward the new powers acquired for Scotland. Presiding officer, every weekday morning across Scotland, parents and carers are waving their children off to school. Quite rightly, they expect that robust measures are in place to keep these young people safe, not just in the classroom, but on the journey to and from school. Um, that we're speaking about the safety of young people today is particularly poignant um, on this terrible day. And I, and I just want to say, I know that we're all going to find this debate possibly quite difficult. As a representative of a rural community, I'm acutely aware of the distances some pupils travel to school and the importance given to such journeys. Additionally, as a parent, I know what it is to entrust the safety of my child into the care of others. I believe that the responsibility to keep young people safe is something that we all share, from teachers and education providers to those of us in elected positions setting national legal and policy direction. The bill before the Chamber today makes important strides in those endeavours. Seatbelts can play a vital role in the event of a road traffic accident. This is borne out through a wealth of internationally recognised research. But we also know that the benefits of encouraging children to buckle up foster productive, positive, lifelong habits in relation to road safety. It's to be welcomed that much of local government shares these sentiments, with 18 councils already voluntarily stipulating seatbelts in all dedicated home-to-school transport contracts. However, I want to ensure this practice becomes universal across every local authority in Scotland as a matter of law. My own local authority, Aberdeenshire Council, was one of the first to insist on seatbelts on all dedicated school transport as they awarded contracts. I want every parent to have the same peace of mind that I have. The powers to be able to legislate on a stipulation in contracts for school transport have now arrived in this place and many local authorities have been moving towards implementation in preparation for the prospect of a new legal duty coming in. Before I move on to key points from the Rural Economy and Connectivities report, I would like to thank all those who have contributed to the call for evidence and witness sessions. And I would also like to thank all members of the Seatbelts and School Transport Working Group and the government ministers and officials who have advised and assisted me. I welcome the committee's support for the general principles of the bill and their constructive comments and recommendations. This support chimes with public feedback. A national consultation in 2016 showed respondents overwhelmingly thought these measures would contribute to road safety, with many questioning why a law had not been implemented sooner. Turning to the detail of the measures, the bill will create a legal duty for local authorities, grant-aided school providers and independent school providers to ensure that vehicles used for dedicated school transport have seatbelts fitted. This includes taxis, minibuses, coaches and buses. Some of these vehicle types are already covered by existing UK laws requiring seatbelts. So it's the larger coach and bus vehicles where changes will be required. Members will be aware that, unlike in some countries, there's not a bespoke model of vehicle used for dedicated school transport. A wide range of vehicles are used, particularly in relation to local authority provision, from double-decker buses designed for urban use to single-decker coaches associated with longer distance travel. Grant-aided and independent schools report that their dedicated school transport is already university supplied with seatbelts, so it's in the local authority provision that the transition has to be made. Collaboration has been key to ensuring that the, message, the measures are clear and workable on the ground, and this is why the Seatbelts on School Transport Working Group has been so important. The group was set up in 2014 as the Scotland Act order devolving power on this issue was being processed. Forming the group has allowed extensive dialogue with stakeholders, experts and delivery organisations, such as local government, the bus industry and parenting and education groups. 
Therefore, the proposals brought before the Parliament have been shaped and influenced by those that they will affect, ensuring that we have a bill whose con which content is practical and fit for purpose. It's been very important that a considered and reasonable implementation timescale is put in place, one which does not put partners under undue pressure. The legal duty will come into force in 2018 for vehicles transporting primary school children and 2021 for vehicles carrying secondary school pupils. This lead-in time helps local authorities and bus operators to adapt to the change. It also means that no contracts should have to be broken as a result. I'm glad to see the committee endorses this approach in its report. Another issue that comes through strongly in the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee's findings is their assertion that these measures should be extended to vehicles used to take pupils on excursions during the school day, such as trips to the swimming pool, for example, as well as home to school transport. And I welcome their comments on this and the views expressed by witnesses in recent committee evidence sessions. The logic of this extension is not hard to see. However, the practical implications will need some consideration. The two kinds of transport are quite distinct in terms of organisation and administration. One is generally done in a three to five year council wide contract, whilst the vehicles used for school trips can be booked singularly and on an ad hoc basis and are organised by the individual schools. School excursions are, however, already covered by robust risk assessment guidance, which stipulates seatbelts should be on vehicles. And initial discussions with our stakeholders report that this is rigidly adhered to. I do not have any objection in principle to putting this on a statutory footing, and I'm currently working with the Scottish Government to gather views and see how it could work on the ground. Since hearing the views of the committee on this, I have already made contact with teaching unions, local government and other stakeholders, and I will give this close consideration ahead of stage two. Presiding officer, one of the undeniable traits of school transport in Scotland is that there is no one-size-fits-all formula for delivery. There are around 2,500 schools in the country spread across a diverse range of geographies with our nation's local authorities. Essentially, we're talking about everything from pupils being driven in a school bus, uh, a school, to school on a double-decker bus in a bustling urban centre to pupils in remote areas such as my constituency in Aberdeenshire travelling relatively long distances on coaches and country roads. Clearly, any attempt at a top-down diktat on how this should work will hamper flexibility and restrict the ability of councils to implement the type of school transport that works best for them and their school pupils. It's therefore very welcome to see that the committee recognise and agree with the need to maintain this flexibility. I am firmly of the belief that the individual local authorities should use the methods of implementation that suit them. I'm aware that methods such as adult bus monitors or supervisors were raised and considered uh, during evidence sessions. And likewise, committee members highlighted some low how some uh, local authorities stipulate a maximum age of vehicle in their contracts. The bill does not restrict school authorities' flexibility on these matters, and indeed will look uh, to point out uh, options and guidance, and will point to different areas of local authorities' good practice. However, making any singular measure a statutory requirement could hinder effectiveness and ultimately be counterproductive. And the uh, issue of flexibility brings me on to considerations around young people with additional support needs or smaller children for whom a normal seatbelt might not fit or be effective. This provision has been looked at in detail with stakeholders and the bill has consciously been drafted to allow for such pupils to be catered for. The legislation does not mandate a specific type of belt and leaves options open for school authorities in terms of using adjustable straps, booster seats or lap belts for smaller children. In practice, young people with additional support needs are often transported in taxis and minibuses in line with existing equalities and support for learning duties on school authorities and the bill does not restrict this. I welcome that the committee gives recognition to the benefits of this in its report. I now turn to an issue which has come through strongly in consultation with people and stakeholders, and that is, how do we ensure children actually wear the seatbelts? 
The laws around seatbelt wearing are reserved to Westminster, yet I'm of the firm view that the bill represents a real opportunity to promote successful approaches and raise wider awareness amongst young people on the safety benefits of wearing seatbelts. That's why there will be comprehensive guidance as well as publicity and educational materials created to accompany the new legal duty coming into force. We've already had dialogue with parenting, education and youth group stakeholders as well as Road Safety Scotland on this. We will also ensure the involvement of young people themselves and I know that the committee supports this. It's crucial that we try and take a positive approach to instilling safety messages and allowing young people to see the benefits of good habits. The correct behaviour isn't unique to the school bus. There's the same need to promote good behaviour in the classroom and representing the school and the community, say at lunch times, for example. Approaches taken to good pupil behaviour are in practice every day in schools across Scotland. Stakeholders at the committee's evidence session used the analogies of society's changed views on smoking or wearing seatbelts in cars, and I wholeheartedly ag agree that habits change and practices become second nature. But it doesn't happen overnight. Yet, by consistent and concerted effort, we can achieve the desired outcome. And let's not forget that Wales have already successfully implemented similar measures on seatbelts without having powers over the devolved liability for wearing them. And so will we. And I know that Aberdeenshire Council have been very proactive when it comes to school transport. And they can give us many successful examples, as well as the other local authorities, to draw from as we refine good practice nationally. Obviously, Stipulating an additional feature such as seat belts in a contract with private bus operators can lead to a cost increase. This regularly happens as contracts end and are renewed. For example, with councils maybe adding new requirements such as CCTV or a certain standard of vehicle or new routes. In helping with the new statutory duties which fall on councils, the Scottish Government has worked with local government to forecast future cost implications and these are set out in the financial memorandum. I'm aware the committee has made some comments on this exercise and the overall estimates which cover a 14 year period from 2018 and we will look at what can be done to give further explanation of the detail of these figures. I've been in touch with COSLA to ask them to provide a representative to give a fuller explanation of how the cost analysis was completed. And I've written to the convener and vice convener of the committee to advise them of this, since COSLA were unable to attend the committee se session that they were invited to. In closing, presiding officer, I would repeat my thanks to the committee for its support for the principles of the bill and the very helpful recommendations it's made. And I move the motion in my name. I now call Edward Mountain to speak on behalf of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. No more than eight minutes, please, Mr Mountain. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Firstly, on behalf of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee, I'd like to welcome this opportunity to summarise our findings on Gillian Martin's bill on seatbelts on school transport. I'd first of all, though, like to thank all those that gave evidence to committee. The evidence we received came from a wide range of people parent groups, councils, transport op operators, Scottish Youth Parliament, named but a few. We also received evidence from school pupils, and I'd like to thank the education outreach services at the Parliament who helped gathering that information during school visits. I'd also like to thank the committee as a whole and the clerks who, I believe, worked very diligently towards the preparation of the report, which I believe is a helpful report. Turning to the bill, I'd like to point out that it is a single purpose bill, which is to introduce a legal requirement for seatbelts to be fitted on all dedicated home to school transport in Scotland. The committee notes broadly positive responses received from our stakeholders and witnesses who are all keen to improve the safety of children. There has, however, been some disquiet from those we heard from as to the bill's purpose is being too specific and narrow. Before I look at the key findings and recommendations, I'd like to make a general comment. The committee heard that the position across Scotland regarding the provision of seatbelts on school transport is mixed. 
It appears that there are in excess of 18 councils, over half the councils in Scotland, who have already demanded that seatbelts are fitted on school transport. Furthermore, we heard that a number of councils are demanding that seatbelts fitted on uh, dedicated school transport is increasing, as are the number of councils that, that demand seatbelts to be fitted on school excursions. Thus, it may appear that the bill may be overtaken by events in that the aim may well be achieved before the staggered implementation dates are reached, a point that I feel may be picked up in open debate. Turning to the key findings, school excursions. The committee was surprised that the bill only covers home to school journeys and not for school trips or excursions. We heard repeatedly from witnesses that this was indeed a failing. It was felt that not having seatbelts available on all school transport sends out a mixed message and diluted the safety issue that the bill is indeed trying to achieve. We also heard that wearing seatbelts on school trips where there is greater supervision would encourage children to continue to wear seatbelts on home to school commutes where there will be fewer adults present. In response to the committee's stage one report, the Scottish Government has indicated that officials have been in touch with teaching unions, local government and other stakeholders to ascertain what the practical implications would be of extending the legal duty in this area. And I've heard today the words of uh, Gillian Martin in relation to this. The committee, however, is clear and it strongly recommends that the bill's provisions should be extended to cover exclusions or trips organised by schools and looks forward to hearing the outcome of these discussions and a possible amendment being brought forward before the conclusion of stage two. As far as wearing seatbelts are concerned, the committee fully understands that the bill makes it a requirement that seatbelts are fitted in dedicated school transport. But it is important that everyone understand that this is very different from the requirement that seatbelts seat belts have to be worn. It became evident during the committee's consideration of the bill that its purpose is limited to the fitting of belts on school transport and many witnesses were concerned about whether school belts once, uh, sorry, seat belts once fitted would actually be worn. Indeed, the committee heard that children under the age of 14 are not required by law to wear seat belt on buses at all. This is not a devolved issue, as Gillian Martin's made out, and therefore it falls under the jurisdiction of the UK Government. As a result of the questions raised in the committee, the Scottish Government did raise the issue with the appropriate UK Minister. The Minister was not able to support a change to the law, but did understand, I believe, the point that, the, the, that was being made. And I believe the committee would look to the government, the Scottish Government, taking this forward again post the election. We heard examples from witnesses of how the wearing of seatbelts is being encouraged, uh, including bus monitors and prefects, edu educational programmes and CTTV. We are convinced that pe pupils need to have greater awareness of the safety benefits of wearing seat belts and that young, uh, sorry, young people need to be involved in creating this guidance. We also heard that the guidance needs to be based on positive action rather than a disciplinary approach. We heard from the Scottish Government that it intends to take this forward with young people and create this guidance, which the committee supports. Turning to the non-statutory guidance, the committee heard that some children may choose not to wear seat belts when they are fitted. This is an issue that we believe needs to be addressed, as I've briefly mentioned earlier. We believe that there should be a packet of guidance and practical support should be provided within the bill's provisions. It is clear there will be need to be behavioural change within schools to encourage children to make the wearing of seatbelts in school transport as natural as it is in the family car. There is also the issue of duty of care and where this lies. And the committee believes that the government must seek to clarify this to allow bus drivers, teachers and all those involved to know where the responsibility of actually making children wear seatbelts sits. The committee also heard about the servicing of seatbelts. The committee heard that it is an annual testing requirement and it is a statutory provision under the UK legislation. The, the committee feels that this is a bare minimum and more regular checks should be done on school transport. It also believes that guidance should be given to operators should they find that seatbelts are found defective when they're being checked in the morning. 
The other issue that the committee looked at was the financial memorandum, which has briefly been mentioned. And it probably raised some of the most more questions than any other specific subject as far as the committee was concerned. The memorandum suggested that requiring all dedicated school transport vehicles to be fitted with seat belts would require an increased cost for bus operators, mainly through retrofitting seat belts, purchasing new vehicles, and increased maintenance costs. The government anticipates that these costs will be passed on to local authorities through higher contract prices. The financial mem memorandum estimates the total cost between 2018 and 31 will be 8.92 million. The government was not clear how this money would be paid to all authorities, and it was not clear that the money would be ring-fenced to achieve the aim that it was being paid for. The government heard that this money could be seen as a reward to those operators who had not fitted seatbelts already and could undervalue those that had. Furthermore, the committee heard the evidence from the transport industry that the fitting of seatbelts was becoming viewed as a minimum standard anyway. As far as EU approval is concerned, we had our first evidence of the session of this bill from the Scottish Government officials on the 15th of March. But it was not until last week that we heard the bill would have to go before the EU for approval before it was passed. This surprised the committee when the Welsh Assembly had passed a bill in a similar circumstances in 2011. In conclusion, the committee supports the member's bill and we welcome the proposed response to the committee on our final report that we received on the 19th of May. Whilst we have reservations on the issue of the fitting of seatbelts on school transport for school excursions and also on the financial memorandum, we do support the general principle of the bill and recommend to the Parliament that they be agreed to. Thank you. I call Hamza Yousaf. No more than seven minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I associate myself with the remarks that Gillian Martin made at the beginning of her contribution? Uh, there will be some people watching this wondering why uh, the Parliament is continuing to sit, but I think it is important, in fact, in defiance uh, of those who seek to disrupt our lives that we continue the business uh, of this chamber. But also, secondly, there can be no uh, more important an issue for us to be uh, striving towards, to be working on collaboratively as individuals, as MSPs, as committees, as committee members, indeed as government, than the safety uh, of our children. Uh, and that is a, a responsibility, I think, in today's debate, we will feel heavier than perhaps we will have felt uh, ever before. Uh, in terms of uh, road safety, it's an issue upon which we place uh, the utmost priority, and we're taking forward a raft of measures across Scotland to reduce risks as we move towards the ambitious casualty targets that are set out in our road safety framework to 2020. Uh, the Chamber uh, will therefore be aware that the Scottish Government fully backs these legislative proposals. They are not new to the Scottish Parliament and indeed uh, emanate from considerations before the Public Petitions Committee in a previous session. Uh, subsequently, Scottish Ministers announced an intention to legislate in 2014, following confirmation from the UK Government that it was willing to transfer competence through a dev uh, devolution instrument specifically on this issue, just uh, as it had done with Wales. As such, the government has been able to undertake significant and in-depth work with stakeholders to ensure a collaborative approach to forming the proposals, and it's been very pleasing to see Ms. Martin utilising that and building on it to refine the proposals uh, that uh, refine the proposals that have been introduced and undergone uh, here at Stage One consideration. I'd like to, of course, convey my thanks to the Rural uh, Economy and Connectivity Committee. I followed proceedings closely and seen firsthand the th thoughtful scrutiny that members have given. My gratitude also extends to all those who gave ed evidence these contributions greatly aid this Parliament's ability to give due consideration. I'll try to touch upon the, some of the themes uh, that uh, the convener touched upon uh, in terms of reservations uh, that the committee uh, perhaps uh, has. Uh, and in that respect, uh, the financial memorandum, as Ms Martin has said, is something that we'll continue to work with COSLA with to explore uh, whether or not uh, there can be some more robust evidence around that cost basis, uh, but also what can be done uh, perhaps to look again at some of those costings. Um, on, on the issue uh, of, of uh, enforcement uh, as well, it's something that I will try to touch upon uh, in some of my remarks. In terms of uh, the, the laws on, on wearing, uh, the committee's report notices surprise, and the convener reiterated that surprise, that there are not laws across the UK to create liability for ensuring youngsters between the ages of 3 and 14 
wear seat belts which are fitted on buses uh, or coaches. Uh, this, <coughs> as the committee convener says, is a, is a reserved issue and the Scottish Government has been pressing the UK Government for some time. Uh, as the convener has said, uh, the UK Government have responded to say that they don't have fixed plans, but on his recommendation uh, and the committee's recommendation, I will, of course, pursue that matter once again uh, after the general uh, election. In terms of some of the observations around seatbelt specification in the committee's uh, report, we welcome uh, the committee's recognition for the need for greater flexibility. Uh, the bill uh, will not be able to stipulate the type of seatbelt, such as a you know, three-point or a lap belt, uh, as this is beyond the scope of competence which has been devolved. However, local authorities have reported that the greater flexibility in such matters is uh, very welcome. Uh, additionally, the committee comments around seatbelts maintenance, uh, and it may be uh, useful if I set some of that in the wider context. Uh, vehicles used for dedicated school transport are subject to road worthiness testing regime. Uh, this is reserved and undertaken on behalf of the UK government uh, by the Driver and Vehicle uh, Standards Agency, DVSA. Uh, in addition to the scheduled vehicle inspection cycle, DVSA officers and the police have powers to undertake unannounced roadside vehicle inspections on buses uh, and coaches. Uh, local authorities also, of course, have the option to employ or appoint their own vehicle inspectors uh, which can monitor buses or coaches used for the dedicated school transport contracts. Uh, additionally, school authorities can also make vehicle standards or maintenance a condition of contract and include punitive measures for any breaches of this. Uh, we will look, of course, to highlight best practice on checking and maintenance of seatbelts into guidance as per the committee's suggestions, and I hope that gives them uh, some uh, elements uh, of comfort. In terms of the European Commission uh, notification, uh, I did, of course, note the, the committee's uh, surprise uh, and, and, and uh, answered questions uh, on this uh, at the committee appearance that I took part in with Ms Martin a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but I would just make the, the, the mention once again and reiterate the point that this bill is slightly different to that of the Welsh bill. Uh, the Welsh bill was wider uh, in scope. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, can I thank the committee uh, for agreeing that the timetable or the amended timetable uh, that suggests that stage two can proceed uh, before notification, which will be done, of course, by the UK government, but before notification, before notification takes place and at stage three scheduled for after the summer recess. So my thanks to the committee for agreeing that timetable. Of course. Mike Rumbles. If I could address the issue that the committee has repeatedly been raising, we haven't had an answer to yet. When the bill was introduced, we were told there were 18 local authorities that had this in their contracts and therefore so many that didn't. And we've actually been asking repeatedly, could we give an up-to-date information as to how many have them in their contracts or are about to have them in the contracts, and we still don't have that information. Hamza Youssef. Let me try to uh, get some of that information uh, for uh, Mike Rumbles, uh, if I can, and I'll respond to my, my closing uh, remarks. But what I did do is I asked for uh, the latest information uh, from local authorities, and uh, the information gathered from local authorities uh, in January 2017 estimated there were 110 vehicles that uh, this, uh, this had transitioned from 323 buses we were aware of in 2014, showing that councils are moving towards uh, compliance. Uh, that uh, number, is, as far as we can gather, uh, hasn't changed. Uh, 110 uh, vehicles uh, is still uh, the latest uh, estimate. Um, but uh, let me also say to, to Mr Rumbles, I think I made this point in, in committee, uh, that even if all 32 local authorities uh, were moving towards that uh, and were in that position uh, of stipulating seatbelts in their contract, uh, we have to legislate to future proof. Uh, there's nothing stopping local authorities rolling back. I, I admit politically it would be incredibly difficult for them to do so, uh, but I think the legislation is important to, to future uh, proof that uh, if possible. Uh, the financial uh, memorandum uh, I think I've already touched upon and said that uh, we will uh, re-examine and re-explore that uh, with COSLA. Uh, now that administrations uh, are uh, taking shape and COSLA itself uh, is taking shape. So I look forward to hearing this debate, I look forward to hearing some of the points, the concerns, the reservations, but uh, hopefully uh, broadly the support uh, for this very good bill being taken forward uh, by my colleague, Ms Martin. I call Jamie Green for up to seven minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to echo the sentiment of the Chamber today. There can be no better subject matter for us to be discussing than the safety of children. I'm pleased to be opening this uh, stage one debate on behalf of my party and also express uh, thanks to Julian Martin for bringing it to this parliament. I too have sat in uh, many evidence sessions in the Rural Economy Committee for a number of weeks on this matter. 
Uh, the Scottish Conservative position on this is that we are largely supportive of its aim. Uh, it shares a common uh, ambition. Uh, however, we do share some of the concerns that other members have voiced already and perhaps may voice today. I'd like to take each of them in turn. Uh, the first concern was raised around that of liability and enforceability. Now, we appreciate that the legislation around the wearing of seatbelts is not a devolved matter. It was, however, uh, originally quite unclear if there would be any liability on a third party uh, if an incident occurred. Uh, we had concerns over whether any recourse could fall on a driver, uh, a prefect, a monitor, a teacher, or even the local authority themselves in the unfortunate situation of an accident. So I think some clarification is necessary on that point. At this point, we'd also like to share uh, our disappointment with any poten potential delayed progression of the bill due to the fact that it must be approved by the EU on the grounds of competition law uh, in regards to its technical standards directive. Uh, we are aware that a similar case was raised through the Welsh Assemb Assembly in 2011, and whilst not exactly the same, there are some parallels with the situation here. This delay may have been avoided with some foresight. Nonetheless, due process must be followed, and we look forward to the outcome of that decision. Moving on to the financial component, uh, components. It is estimated, as already has been mentioned, that the total cost of fitting seatbelts on 110 buses and coaches could amount to £8.92 million, which in effect will be covered by the Scottish Government. And of course, it is entirely normal for the financial repercussions of a bill to form part of its scrutiny. And whilst I expect this figure might be a worst-case scenario, there does some, uh, seem to be so, uh, unanswered questions over the allocation of this subsidy. For example, will all local authorities get a portion of this budget, and how will it be carved up? Will there be any historic payments made to local authorities who previously spent funds on ensuring that seatbelts were part of their school transport contracts? Will any funding that is made available by the Scottish Government to the, uh, for this purpose and given to local authorities be ring-fenced for this purpose alone, or will it simply be allocated through block grant and, indeed, on a trust basis? In our view, clarity on the funding elements of this legislation is required as we progress through the stages of the bill. I think that leads next, uh, to my next point, which is uh, quite a more fundamental one. This parliament will need to consider whether or not there is a need to legislate at all. Now, given that at least 18 of our 32 local authorities currently stipulate the need for seatbelts and dedicated school transportation, this does seem to be the general direction of travel. According to the MVA consultancy research, even back in 2013, 85% of dedica dedicated school transport already had seatbelts fitted. So whilst best practice is welcome, is intervention the only way to ensure that this happens across 100% of local authorities and 100% of vehicles? Now, we are open-minded as to the need for a bill, uh, but only if the bill is adequately structured and impactful and offers good value for public spending. Uh, my final point is one uh, which you will no doubt hear much of today, and that is around the inclusion or indeed exclusion of other school-related trips on buses. Now, as it stands at the moment, the bill will not cover school excursions, field visits or school trips. Uh, it only applies to dedicated school commuting. Now, this makes very little sense to us. Now, surely the application of duty of care should be applied to all circumstances where a child is on board a school bus. Now, I do appreciate that this opens up a very separate debate around the fact that schools often contract directly with operators for ad hoc trips, but we should not avoid having that debate. Uh, my colleagues today will go into more detail on this and some of these issues and also some, of, uh, some other points that they would like to raise with the Chamber. Now, I agree in principle that tackling this issue will make a difference. Uh, the WHO published statistics recently showing that seatbelts substantially reduce the risk of minor injuries and can reduce fatalities resulting uh, from collisions by up to 25%. But the fitting of seatbelts is just the cog in a wheel of a much wider road safety campaign. This parliament should consider the issue of education and responsibility. Uh, we believe that education is absolutely key to the success of such schemes. Children should want to wear a seatbelt on a bus in the same way that they do without hesitation putting one on in their family car. 
So the tone and method of the education and the enforcement message is vital to changing mindsets, especially amongst older pupils. Uh, in closing, I would like to uh, thank Gillian Martin for her, her enthusiastic pursuit uh, of this bill to date, but we do feel there are uh, many uh, loose ends that need, need to be tied up before we progress to uh, stage two. In principle, we will support the aims of the bill at this stage, but we would like to see the inclusion of uh, extra trips and ex excursions as a baseline for progress uh, on this bill. So I would request that the member and indeed the Scottish Government carefully consider uh, many of the comments and concerns that members might share in today's debate. We will monitor its progress carefully. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Green. I call Neil Bibby. Uh, up to seven minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. Um, at the outset, let me recognise the work of Gillian Martin in bringing this bill to the Parliament, and let me thank the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee for their Stage 1 report. As uh, the convener, Edward Mountain, uh, said, in addition to the usual pattern of scrutiny and evidence taken, committee members uh, also found the time to visit schools and gauge the opinion of young people uh, themselves. Um, so let me also at this point commend the, the staff of the Parliament who made those external visits to schools possible and let me welcome the input of all those young people who participated. This bill affects them more than anyone else and it's only right that they were given the opportunity and are given the opportunity to have their stay. Presiding officer, this bill marks a step forward. It may be a small step forward, but it's a step forward nonetheless. There are thankfully according to what evidence is available to us, very few injuries involving children travelling on school transport. Just 45 children are injured per year on buses and coaches. However, when it comes to preventable injuries on transport to and from school, I'm sure we would agree across the chamber that any injury brings, that brings harm to a child is one too many. It's therefore only right that we collectively consider what preventative steps we can take to make school transport safer. Although the focus of this bill is narrow and specific, it does raise a number of wider issues relating to the safety of school transport. In their report, the committee have addressed some of uh, those issues alongside the specific provisions of the bill. Not just considering the merits of fitting seatbelts on school transport, but considering the behavioural changes and the wider legislative changes that may be required to protect those young passengers. And so in addition to endorsing the general principles of Gillian Martin's bill today, I also want to welcome the wider debate that has been initiated about the use of seatbelts and the safety of children. It's important we consider what changes could be made during uh, stage two. The bill itself could be broader and more ambitious. Rather than echoing the intentions of the government, it could be stretched further. We could have used similar legislation in Wales as a starting point for our own proposals. In Wales, every bus provided or secured by a relevant body and used for the purpose of learner transport must have a seat belt fitted to every seat. Service buses there, which are used for dedicated learner transport, even if the majority of their journeys are not for dedicated learner transport, will need to be fitted with seat belts. That's not to detract from the merits of the proposed bill before us, but simply to point out to the Parliament that this bill could be different. And has been acknowledged, the bill does not, for example, cover dedicated transport that is used for school excursions or trips. The committee uh, recommends that the provision of the bill be extended to ensure that it does, and we would agree. Why should there not be the same protection for a 20-minute journey home after school and also for a school trip that could take children further from home and could last 60 minutes, 90 minutes or even more? Importantly, as members will be aware, the bill requires that seat belts are fitted. It does not require that seat belts are worn. The fitting of seat belts alone does not in itself make school transport safer, a point uh, made by the Scottish Parent Teacher Council in their written evidence. There has to be a concerted effort to change behaviour, to promote safety and responsibility on school buses and to ensure that seat belts, which are already widely fitted anyway, are properly used. Uh, I noted in the, the committee report, secondary pupils are described in the report as, ha as being a tough audience to convince to wear seat belts, and certainly would have been the case on, on my school bus when I was a, a child. Um, indeed, at one of the high schools visited during that inquiry, 74% of pupils said they were unlikely or not at all likely to wear seat belts. 
That is a clear illustration of how far we still need to go to change behaviour with some age groups. And if safety of children is paramount, we need to look at a range of um, issues in, 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 in changing that behaviour. And we also need to look at the role of escorts on school buses who um, perform an important uh, or have import, um, uh, performed an important role in school buses um, in, in ensuring safety. The committee also made a very sensible recommendation that the Scottish Government and the UK Government work together to ensure all children aged 3 to 14 are covered by a legal requirement to wear seatbelts. And in doing so, the Scottish Government could begin to consider who should be responsible for ensuring that such a requirement is met, the school, the local authority, the driver. It's a different matter from one before us today, but it's nonetheless a matter demanding our attention. The Scottish Government may also wish to consider requirements relating to nursery transport given the expansion of the early years sector. Presiding Officer, the Royal Society for the Prevention of Accidents in written evidence to the committee say that they support the fitting and wearing of appropriate restraints on all methods of transport, including school transport. However, they also point to evidence showing that adult-style three-point belts and lap belts are not necessarily appropriate for children under 12. I therefore seek any, an assurance from the Scottish Government that attention will be paid to the concerns of the society. Presiding officer, there has been some debate already regarding the financial memorandum to this bill. The cumulative cost of implementing the provisions of the bill is estimated to be around £8.92 million. The committee say they are unconvinced of that figure. Evidence from SPT and the Confederation for Passenger Transport suggests that the costs involved in tendering for the necessary work will not be as high as anticipated. Clarity is needed. The Scottish Government have indicated that they will work with stakeholders to assess whether further work has to be done to refine forecasts. Whatever forecasts the Government set on, it is important that the Councils have time to plan for any changes that can, could increase their costs and that there is cer certainty about any contribution that those costs uh, that may come from central government. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, it is important that we as a Parliament not only understand the purpose of this Bill, but also the limitations of this Bill ahead of amendment stages. It may be different, it could go further. It could, if it is the right thing to do, we should consider uh, whether we should be implementing it in 2020 or sooner than 2021 for secondary schools. And it must stand alongside measures to drive a change in behaviour, because alone it is not enough. This is, this is a modest proposal, but nevertheless, as a proposal, we are prepared to support. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Green and Mr Bibby, for finishing well within time. We are already over time, so speeches have absolutely no more than five minutes. Uh, John Mason, followed by Liam Kerr. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, the starting point, I think, has to be that there was widespread support for this bill at committee, as I think all of us saw it as a way of trying to improve safety for young people on their way to school. The qu question was whether the bill was actually necessary, and we were told that 18 local authorities out of 32 already did require seatbelts on school buses, and Strathclyde authorities are expected to follow suit after the summer. The financial memorandum refers to 323 buses in 2014 eh, not having seat belts, and we understand this was recently down to 110, so the number has fallen quite dramatically. Would full implementation happen without legislation? We probably cannot say for sure, and it may well be that the promise of legislation is spurring on the other local authorities. And I suppose I have to say my own feeling is that we're better to be safe than sorry, and having the legislation gives us a belt and braces approach. Uh, we quickly came across the issue that even with this legislation, some pupils would have belts available and others would not. Many young people travel to school on service buses and they clearly do not have seat belts. The bill can affect that, um, but there could be a change uh, on buses for school trips, and I would certainly support that as well. It's one thing to ensure there are belts on the buses, but another to make sure that young people are actually wearing them. And we understood from evidence that for some young people it was not cool to wear a seat belt, and clearly there will have to be guidance and educational materials on that. Uh, on all of these points, I think committee colleagues uh, will go into more detail uh, on the committee's thinking. However, the issue I wanted to concentrate on was finance. Because of the tight timescale, the Economy Committee, rather than the Finance Committee, looked at the financial memorandum as explained in paragraph 89 of our report. We were immediately struck by the potential cost of £8.9 million, given that we had been told there were only 110 buses operating without seatbelts. This seemed an extraordinarily high cost of over £80,000 per bus 
to get seatbelts fitted retrospectively. But we were then told that this was not how the figure had been calculated. In fact, this figure is based on all local authorities receiving a payment, whether or not they had compliant buses. And the figure was based on potential increases to contract prices with bus operators over the next 14 years. We also heard this figure had been agreed by COSLA. Now, to take these points in turn, firstly, I take the point that by paying all local authorities for the changes, councils who have been proactive and already had belts fitted are not losing out. As paragraph 96 of our report says, funding will be distributed subject, quote, subject to the established settlement and distribution process, unquote, and therefore not according to the needs of particular councils. On the other hand, given the relatively small number of buses not meeting the standard, it does seem a huge amount of money to be paying. As the money is not ring-fenced, any local authority will be able to use it, any excess, for any good purposes. And I'm sure none of us would grudge local authorities a bit of extra money. But I don't think that was the aim of the bill. Secondly, the financial memorandum does also give a lower figure of £2.35 million for purely changing the non-compliant buses. And that was based on the number of 323. So it might well be considerably lower for 110. Now, I'm not clear why this figure is not being used as the planned cost. In addition, we did get the impression from witnesses that where contracts had been renewed and included seatbelts, the increased cost in contract had been pretty minimal, as paragraphs 93, 94, 95 say. Thirdly, COSLA and the local authorities agree the figure of 8.9 million, and I think actually have produced it themselves. And I have to confess, I'm afraid that does set alarm bells ringing for me. If these are the figures that COSLA and the council submitted, I would wonder if they were a bit on the high side. Very often in Parliament, committees have been concerned that the proposed cost of a bill in the financial memorandum was too low, and councils or other organisations might be left footing any extra. However, this time we seem to be in a slightly odd situation where those incurring the cost seem very happy with it, and it is committee which is concerned that this is not good value for money. So as the report says, quote, <clears throat> the committee remains unconvinced that the 8.92 million cumulative costs of implementing the bill's provisions, as outlined in the financial memorandum, are justified, unquote. In conclusion, I'm very happy to support this bill, even though it's possible that buses will all have seatbelts fitted anyway. I would also support any amendment to widen the coverage of the bill. However, my key concern is the proposed cost and whether 8.9 million is really necessary to achieve the end of safer bus travel, which we all support. Thank you. I call Liam Kerr to be followed by Gail. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome today's Stage 1 debate on the seatbelts on School Transport Scotland Bill and join with my colleagues across the Chamber by supporting the legislation in principle. There is no doubt that failing to wear a seatbelt exposes people to unnecessary danger. And I accept that the provision of seatbelts on school buses can help children develop good habits which ultimately translate into greater safety. Accordingly, I think this is a commendable attempt to improve the safety of children, and I'm comfortable in voting for the passage of this bill at stage one. I'd like to, in my remarks, highlight three areas that before stage two may benefit from greater reflection. Firstly, the issue of enforcement. We were all school children once, and we know what school buses can be like. It is hard enough to get some of them to sit down let alone put a seatbelt on. As was stated by Murray Council's submission to the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee, seatbelts are not seen as cool or necessary by many young people, particularly when they move up to secondary school and face new peer pressures. Yet, as we've heard a few times, this bill only covers home to school transport and not school trips or excursions, such that, for example, minibuses might not be fitted with belts. So, a whole tier of transport could exist on which seatbelts are not mandated. Now, I'm pleased to hear Gillian Martin's comments that she's working on this and on the messaging of this, but my concern is that if we are saying to children seatbelt fitting is mandatory, as it's so important for safety, and then have a, an entire subset of transport on which seatbelts are not mandated, then there's a risk we've diluted the message to such a degree that they'll not actually be used where they have been fitted. Secondly, I have concerns around the costs and clarity of this bill. With nearly 95% of dedicated school transport already fitted with seatbelts, is there not a risk that the Scottish Government will be hit with an £8.9 million bill whilst 
rewarding the small percentage of bus companies that haven't already fitted seat belts. I'm also, as others have raised, a, a little concerned whether this is the absolute figure for this retrofitting and would prefer a much more detailed breakdown of the figures and I'm glad again to hear Gillian Martin's comments on that. Which also begs a potential question about where the 9 million is going to, or nearly 9 million is going to come from. In an era of tight public finances, which budget might need to face cuts to fund the provision? And that's not to mention the on cost and responsibility of maintenance because Imagine, uh, just run with this, but imagine if the seatbelts were fitted but didn't work in an accident. Who's liable? Is that the operator? Is it the council? Is it the government? Uh, and given that the funds may not be ring-fenced, does this bring pressure on already hard-pressed and underfunded councils? Uh, the final point I wish to reflect on, the Bill's policy memorandum highlights that local authorities are increasingly moving towards stipulating the needs for seatbelts in their dedicated school transport contracts voluntarily. National guidance already states seatbelts should be fitted as a condition within dedicated school transport contracts. And as we've heard, nearly 95% of dedicated school transport already has seatbelts fitted. Uh, 18 local authorities already require the provision of seatbelts in all dedicated school bus contracts, up from four in 2009. A further six require them on some contracts. So, as the point was made, I think, by John Mason earlier on, isn't there a strong possibility that by the time this becomes law in 2018, 2021, all buses will have seatbelts fitted as a function of councils demanding seatbelts as part of their contracts? And if so, there has to be a risk that we are legislating for legislating's sake. Now, I hear John Mason's thinking on this, and it is an interesting debate. Uh, my view is that bringing in legislation often simply succeeds in making compliance more difficult. An excessively crowded legislative landscape can hinder economic activity, it can create burdens for individuals, businesses and communities and obstruct good government. So I simply pose the question which Jamie Green raised earlier, is adding to this legislative jungle actually the best and most effective way to achieve the end game? Deputy Presiding Officer, I reiterate my support in principle for the seatbelts bill, but prior to stage two, I believe a period of reflection is in order, particularly around whether a bill which does not cover all school transport is sufficient to promote the wearing of seatbelts. Secondly, whether the government is inadvertently rewarding those companies who've not yet fitted seatbelts, and whether we really need more legislation to achieve something that is more appropriately achieved in other ways. Thank you. I call Gail Ross to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Thank you, President Officer. Like many others, when I first heard that Gillian Martin was bringing forward a member's bill to ensure that seat belts were fitted on dedicated school buses, my first thought was, why is this not being done already? And it turns out that some local authorities are already, are already doing it. We heard about um, 18 uh, with a further six on some routes and vehicles. But whilst this progress is good, we have 32 local authorities I think we still have a long way to go. But let me give the Chamber a bit of background to this bill. In 2007, Lynn Merrifield, on behalf of Kingseat Community Council, lodged a petition with the Scottish Parliament on school bus safety, calling on the Scottish Government to make provision for every school bus to be installed with three-point seatbelts for every school child passenger. But unfortunately, because that law was still reserved to Westminster, Scottish ministers could not compel local authorities to do so. But the power was devolved to the Scottish Parliament in 2015. Presiding Officer, the fact that we are now debating this today in the Chamber of the Scottish Parliament is a very proud moment. And I would like to thank Lynn Murrayfield and Gillian Martin from the bottom of my heart, because as a mother, there is nothing in this world that is more important to me than making sure my son is safe. And having seatbelts on school transport is a vital part of that for so many parents. When I was a child, I took a bus to and from school every day, and there were no seat belts on them then. There were no seat belts in the back of cars then. <laughs> yeah, it was, no, it wasn't that long ago. Um, but with changes to legislation over time, we've come to realise what an essential part of travel they are. When I get in a car, the first thing I do before anything else is put on my seat belt. It's automatic, it's a habit. The aim is also to make this the first thing that kids do on a bus on their way to and from school. Awareness, education and reinforcement. Being safe is cool, Liam Kerr. Seatbelts keep you safe. 
But that's the big question. How do schools and local authorities ensure that once the seatbelts are fitted, they are actually used? As a committee, we scrutinised every aspect of this report and took evidence from a number of experts. And the Scottish Youth Parliament gave a powerful account from young people themselves. They have advised that guidance should be prepared with young people. They need to have ownership of this, whether it's bus mon monitors, mentorships or educational events. There are many different schemes already in place in schools all over the country that are very successful and these should be looked at. During the course of the committee deliberations, I brought up the question of maintenance of seatbelts. I've travelled on buses all over the Highlands and I've encountered seatbelts that don't work. Under no circumstances do we want to see children and young people not wearing their seatbelt because it's broken or they are unable to use it. And the answer that I was given was that seatbelts are covered by the bus MOT and will be checked regularly. Presiding officer, we must encourage frequent and thorough checks and maintenance and make sure that young people are comfortable telling the driver or the responsible person on the bus if a seatbelt is out of action. And the guidance given to all local authorities should emphasise that all seatbelts must be in working order and I welcome the Minister's commitment to this. In the policy objectives, it stated that over the period 2010 to 2015, an average of 42 children were slightly injured while travelling by bus or coach in Scotland each year, with a further three children per year seriously injured. Luckily, no children have lost their lives while travelling on buses or coaches during this period. Presiding officer, this is not a safety measure that can wait any longer. The legislation needs to be in place. Neil Bibby is completely correct when he said one injury is one too many. In committee, some members have questioned if all local authorities are planning to have seatbelts fitted on school transport, was the legislation even needed? I've spoken to a few of my colleagues since then and one of them told me, quote, we have been trying to get our local authority to do this for years and they keep putting it off. There is no guarantee that it would happen if they were not forced into doing it, unquote. This is why we need the legislation. We simply cannot base our children's safety on a what-if scenario. I've also been doing some local consulting. I would like to thank William Gulfillan, Head of Community Services at Highland Council, and all the teachers that replied to me. I found your responses extremely useful, and every single teacher I spoke to is in favour of the bill. And although I've supported this bill since it was brought to committee, it has made my resolve stronger to see it pass. As a government, as a parliament, and as a society, we owe it to our young people. Thank you. I call Daniel Johnson to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. This is fundamentally a debate about child safety. And on a day such as this, it, it's difficult not to think about the tragic events in Manchester last night. You know, as a parent, I think one of the most difficult things you can do is step back and give your child the space it needs to explore the world. And undoubtedly, your child's first concert is one of those important milestones. So I cannot even begin to understand what parents are going through who've lost children or indeed don't know where their children are. Um, our thoughts go to those families and our thoughts are with those 22 lost lights that we've lost from this world. But the, today we're talking about seatbelts and transport school and, and in a sense, it's about that parental trust, that there is a duty of care, as Edward Manton put it. And I think it's vital that we explore every safeguard that we can put in place, every feature that we can put in place to protect our children. And that's uh, none more so than on that journey to school. So I thank Gillian Martin for bringing forward this bill. I think it's an important step forward. Indeed, I remember when she mentioned that she was bringing it forward on the steps of the garden lobby, and I too was one of those people who said, you mean that's not the law already? And so I think it, this is a really important step in terms of closing those loopholes, taking those additional steps so that we can honour that trust that parents put. But I think it also touches on something um, around the wraparound the school day, because increasingly parents are working. They, they, we don't have stay-at-home parents who are able to do that school journey, take their children to school. And so I think the, the uh, journey to and from school touches on that wraparound care that we all need to work towards, whether that's breakfast clubs, after school clubs, and indeed school transport. But I would like to ask whether or not this bill does go far enough. And I think a number of members have already raised the questions. Uh, Gillian Martin uh, said that, that she felt that the bill couldn't go further in the interest of flexibility and, of effect and effectiveness. And as this bill proceeds through further stages, I think it would be good to hear more about 
uh, where her concerns are around that effectiveness so that we can explore the full scope uh, and possibilities of this law. Indeed, I think we need to look at the context of this. We've already seen um, uh, significant improvements in safeties uh, for around uh, minibuses and coaches with uh, the legislation that's been brought forward in 1997 and 2001. And I think the points around school excursions are extremely well made because it's because of the tragic accident on the M40 in 1993 where several 12 and 13 year old children returning from a school excursion lost their lives that the bill was introduced in 1997. That, that uh, required uh, the uh, seat belts in minibuses and then 2001 legislation which required them in coaches as well. So I'd ask this question, given that coaches built from 2001 are required to have those seat belts, what are we actually talking about? We're talking about 110 coaches, as John Mason points out, that are old. Why are we taking our children to school in old buses which no longer meet the current standards? And I think John Mason's uh, lesson in mathematics, looking at those costs, I think, was useful. I think we need to question those costs very carefully. That £8.9 million divided by 110 gives you £80,000 per bus. For £80,000, surely we can upgrade those buses to full yeah, and maybe even buy new buses. So let's probe those costings. Let's look at what we can do. Let's ask whether or not we are doing everything. Should we be giving those monies directly to bus companies to pay for those upgrades rather than giving them to local authorities? These are the sorts of questions that we need to ask. These are the sorts of issues that we need to explore. Because while we have come so far on road safety, that progress has often been slow. The first three-point seatbelt was installed in a car in 1958. The UK legislation to install them in new cars only came forward in 1967. Well, the, 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 the requirement to wear those seatbelts only came in in 1983. The law only required seatbelts to be fitted in the back seats of cars in 1987. We cannot tolerate such tardy, slow progress when it comes to road safety. We cannot tolerate any complacency around uh, safety when it comes to the transportation of our children. So I, I would urge um, members, as we look at this bill in stage two and stage three, to think about how we can improve it. Because this is welcome. I think it's an important step forward. But we must ask, can it go further? We cannot, I think, afford the complacency of the past. We must do everything we can to protect our children. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Johnson. I call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Peter Chapman. Mr Stevenson, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Sometimes we legislate to fix a problem, sometimes we legislate to prevent a problem, sometimes to reform or simplify, sometimes to create opportunity, sometimes for the benefit of institutions or individuals. The reason we legislate are many and diffuse, and my list is far from complete. But each bill must stand on its merits or fall because of its shortcomings. The Seatbelts Bill lies in the territory of fixing a problem and of preventing a problem. Now, as a member's bill, it is of necessity uh, relatively uh, limited in its scope. So why this bill and why now? Um, I want to talk about my late constituent, Ron Beatty from Gamery. Uh, he turned his attention to the safety of transporting school students after his granddaughter was severely uh, uh, affected by an accident after alighting uh, from a school bus. And I've met uh, his granddaughter, uh, and I met uh, Ron Beatty uh, not long before he died, as indeed uh, Gillian Martin did, to discuss this prospective bill. He was one of these dogged campaigners that uh, Scotland perhaps particularly uh, throws up. He understood there were no simple, no quick uh, solutions. But for over a decade, Ron attended public petitions, committee meetings, other committee meetings, parliamentary debates, wherever road safety uh, was being covered. Even if it was likely only to be a procedural consideration, the odds are Ron had made the four plus hours journey to Edinburgh to show us all that he was holding us to account. But the bill is, of course, not the limit of what campaigned, uh, Ron campaigned for, but it is a useful part for it. Requiring the fitting of seatbelts and school buses is a power we can now exercise, requiring that they are worn is currently beyond our powers. But because we can only do a little, we should not choose to do nothing, because we cannot do all that we want to do. 
we can, should, must persuade people to use seatbelts. As we've been reminded in the last couple of days by one bus company, even when every bus is fitted with seatbelts, we need legislation in place to keep that so for the future, for everyone, forever. Now let's consider the value of seatbelts in our road transport system. Um, we've just heard some of the dates and I won't uh, repeat them, but I will uh, say that we've seen thousands of lives uh, saved uh, by seatbelts. The United States uh, Department of Transport estimated in one of the early years of their fitting seatbelts that 12,000 lives had been saved. For my part, I first uh, fitted seatbelts to my car in 1964 after seeing the brain damage suffered by a patient uh, for whom I was a nurse, and I wore them from that day onwards. More recently, I came upon a road accident where a driver had not been wearing a seatbelt and was scalped uh, in an urban collision with a comparatively low impact speed. And it was not a pretty sight. Not, I could tell you more if you wish, but I shan't. We have all but normalized the wearing of safety hats by cyclists, shows what can be done. We now need to achieve the same breakthrough in the wearing of seat belts in buses. It's already uh, legally required, according to a fully referenced article on Wikipedia, in the Czech Republic from 2004, Finland 2006, France, Germany, Japan, even Burma from last year. Um, now, the relevant regulation is the Motor Vehicles Wearing of Seatbelts Amendment Regulations 2006. And I had a quick look at it uh, just to remind myself of some of it in the light of some of the remarks that have been from Liam Kerr and Gail Ross. And at section three, it appears to suggest that seatbelts must always be in conformity with regulations. Uh, in the context, what I take from that is they have to be kept in working order. They will be checked at the MOT, that's for sure, but there is a legal obligation to keep them in working order. That's uh, what I take from that. I will say, like lots of legislation, the legislation is complex. It amends other legislation. Now, it also requires that uh, the driver tells passengers to wear it or that there's a sign in every seat in blue. That, I've seen this sign many a time. I didn't know what it meant. I'd really wonder uh, whether it's particularly effective. Uh, so again, that is something that needs to be done. I very much welcome uh, this bill. I'm happy to support the general principles of the bill. I wish the bill bon voyage. Thank you very much, Mr. Stevenson. I call Peter Chapman to be followed by John Finney. Mr. Chapman, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. This is a bill which, like apple pie and motherhood, it is impossible to be against. It is a simple and focused bill that aims to make it a legal requirement for seat belts to be fitted to all dedicated home-to-school buses in Scotland. But despite its simplicity, however, there are several uh, shortcomings coming within, within the proposal. Sorry about that. The I can always hear you, Mr. Chapman. There you go. You should always project, they say. The most significant and obvious of which is that the bill, in its current form, makes no provision for the same level of care for school children on school trips during school time. And I believe that this is a serious and concerning omission. And in discussion between stakeholders and Gillian Martin, MSP, the member responsible for bringing this bill forward, there was an agreement to look at this issue again in a more in-depth manner with the possibility of amending the bill to include this. And I think that that is vital going forward and must be addressed. The committee heard that there are serious difficulties in persuading young people over 14 to actually wear the belts when fitted, and this again must be urgently addressed. During evidence, it was highlighted that older pupils were cynical about wearing of seat belts on school transport, with one of the young respondents even stating, and I quote, no one puts seat belts on on my school bus as it's uncool. And if the driver comes round and tells people to wear them, they just get taken off against once he's driving. So further, the consultation found that 74% of young people were not at all likely or unlikely to wear the seat belts. If tackled correctly, as First Bus UK said, this is an opportunity to educate children and explain to them the benefits of seat belts and the need to use them. 
There is also a lack of clarity surrounding who will be responsible for ensuring that belts are worn, something which the Association of Directors of Education in Scotland also raised in their written submission. And the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee heard that it was impractical for the bus driver to monitor the situation whilst he was driving the vehicle. Now, regardless of who has the duty of care, guidance and mentoring will need to be put in place. Another matter that is of, of paramount importance and ought to, be, ought to be confronted is the type of belt that is fitted. And there are issues with shoulder type three point belts being inappropriate for children under 12 years old or those that are under 135 centimeters tall, as they are not safe for younger children. In this case, it would appear that booster seats would also be required. So to this end, it is clear that discussions must take place between local authorities and bus operators regarding the most suitable type of belts to be fitted. A further anomaly is the fact that children traveling to school on service buses open to fare paying passengers will not be covered as there is no requirement for these types of buses to have seat belts fitted. Now we believe the option of using service buses needs to remain as the most cost effective option in built up areas and to reduce congestion and pollution levels. But this, this does mean that these kids do not have the same level of protection on their way to school. Now during debate there were no real answers to this question. And the final issue that, issue that I have with the bell is the provision of the 8.92 million of cumulative costs, which we've already heard about from several people. And given that 18 local authorities have already implemented seat belts on their school fleets, and others are in the process, I remain unconvinced that this sum of money is necessary. Indeed, the authorities who already have seat belts fitted report that the additional costs were negligible. The costs appear to have been absorbed as buses were renewed and new contracts put in place. There was also an expectation by some members within the committee that given that these provisions aren't being brought into force on 20, until 2018 for primary schools and 2021 for secondary schools, that by these dates all local authorities will already have contracts in place which require seat belts to be fitted. In which case, this bill would be obsolete by the time it came into force. So in conclusion, presenting officer, whilst I agree that this bill is a positive step forward for the safety of our children, I urge the Scottish Government to go further and address the pressing unanswered questions that many have raised today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Chapman. I call John Finney and possibly Mike Rumbles, uh, put out a Rumbles alert. Mr Finney, please. Thank you, uh, President Officer. Uh, I'd like to support the laudable aims of the bill and uh, congratulate Julian Murray, um, Martin, sorry, in taking it this far. And to say that at decision time tonight, the Scottish Game Party will support the general principles. Uh, uh, the key phrase in the, um, and it was important to start off with that positive because I'm going to go on to, to, to the financial aspects. Key phrase in the, the executive summary, the committee remains unconvinced. And, we, and the, it was on the one aspect of the um, money. 8.92 million. And I think the important, you understand the important role is uh, the committee is to scrutinise and to understand who benefits and why. So in the first instance, I, I went to the financial memorandum and it says, and I quote, the best estimates of the cost implications associated with implementation of the bill. This is the purpose of the financial memorandum. Then goes on to say, the best estimates of the timescales over which the cost implications are expected to arise. That's a forward projection rather than uh, a backward looking. And an indication of the margins of uncertainty in these estimates. So uh, I'm keen to understand as what the committee was about the element of retrospection that may apply in this. And we hope to get some clarity in a letter. And this was a letter that came from the Transport Policy Road Safety Team uh, to uh, our convener. And if I read from it, just as there uh, um, is not a standard cost per pupil or cost per journey for local authorities across Scotland, it is not possible to count individual binary units in terms of buses to quantify the financial impact of the bill. The most appropriate way to calculate this is to use professional expertise, and I'll come back to that phrase later, to estimate the impact on the overall contract cost borne by the school. Then goes on to say, uh, further on, it's not possible to isolate the precise role that a new seatbelt requirement would play in affecting every future contract across Scotland using the cost of upgrades for individual vehicles. 
Now, returning to the financial memorandum uh, again, um, at paragraph 22, existing dedicated school transport contracts between school authorities and bus companies are commercially sensitive and therefore cannot be scrutinised individually in order to provide case studies. Additionally, given the fluctuating nature of contract prices and the number of requirements within them, it is not possible to definitively calculate how this will change in future years. And as such, the best estimates have to be based on forecasts from local authority professionals with contracting expertise. So that's us back to the professionals again. And uh, further on, we hear that um, what could be included in the cost of tables was these include manufacturing costs, vehicle maintenance, part replacement of drivers um, and driver's wages. The MVA model then estimates to what extent these costs are likely to feed into the school bus contract costs. Now, I have to say that if it hadn't been this particularly large uh, sum of money, I doubt that I would have uh, looked in it as others did. And indeed, the letter was in specific response to a question posed by my colleague, John Mason. Um, paragraph 28 again, says, due to confidentiality arrangements with local authorities, finance directors, COSLA was unable to share forecasts broken down by individual local authorities and to share the spe specific methodology each had used to calculate its figures. I have to say, I, I find that quite damning, particularly given the... So, having said that, I take reassurance that, uh, uh, indeed, the member said there'll be a further explanation coming from COSLA. And the minister himself talked about a more robust evidence, because I think that's very important. It would be, uh, I, I don't know anyone who doesn't support the aims of this bill. And, of course, we're here because of modest evolution, just modest evolution that's f facilitated that. And some of the concerns I've heard colleagues say, of course, could be addressed if construction and use, many of the factors that Mr. Stevenson referred to, were uh, uh, devolved. Um, Societal change is what will drive this on. Smoking has changed, the wearing of seatbelts. Indeed, I was involved in a serious road accident myself many years ago and wouldn't be here but for seatbelts. So I'm a big fan. Um, and the rural implications have been taken on board and touch on the, the issue of community contracts, dual contracts. So when the member talks about tailoring their practice, um, uh, th then that does um, pick up on, on the issue there that um, rural communities um, where fair paying passengers are also included uh, aren't um, going to miss out on this. School ex excursions, we're told by the member, are covered by a robust risk assessment. But the, the reality is that everything should be covered by a risk assessment. And we need to understand the financial implications of this, but very happy to lend support to the bill. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Finney. I call Mike Rumbles to be followed by Marie Todd. Mr Rumbles, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. First of all, I'd like to congratulate Gillian Martin for bringing forward this bill. It has, of course, as we've all heard this afternoon, a single purpose, that of introducing a legal requirement for seat belts to be fitted on all dedicated home-to-school transport in Scotland. Now, this is a commendable aim. I'm only astonished that this was not already a requirement for all our dedicated school transport and that it has been felt necessary to bring forward a bill to make this the law of the land. All 32 local authorities in Scotland enter into contracts for school transport. It is, as I say, astonishing that all 32 councils haven't already made this a requirement in their contracts with individual operators. On introducing the bill, Gillian Martin informed the committee that only 18 councils have so far made it a requirement for all their contracts for home to school transport, while another six require it for some contracts only. Now, it would seem that our local authorities have been somewhat slow to say the least to ensure their contracts contain the requirement to have seat belts fitted on dedicated school transport. However, as I said earlier in an intervention on the Minister, every time the committee has tried to get up to date information about how many local authorities have this requirement stipulated in their contracts, and more importantly, how many have an intention to do so in their contracts, we seem to draw a blank. We've asked the Scottish Government for this information, and so far the information has not been forthcoming, and I don't understand, I simply don't understand why this should be so. So I was heartened to hear the Minister say it when I intervened that in the summing up, he should have that, I'd be very surprised, but he should have that information available and it would be delightful if he could. The committee also flagged up the issue of the financial cost of the legislation and we've heard about this. The financial memorandum stating that the Scottish Government believes that if this bill is passed 
it would cost a sum of up to £8.92 million. So that's £8.92 million of public money for a bill that may simply incorporate into law a requirement which may already be implemented across Scotland by the time the law comes into force. Like John Mason, like Jamie Green and others, I question whether it is a good use of public money to spend such a sum unnecessarily. Other members, I'm sure, will outline other concerns, as they have done already, about the level of public money being allocated to this process. Of course, Jamie, yes. I just wanted to clarify for the record that it's I'm not questioning sense. whether any government government money is spent on this. Yes, it's Jamie Green. I'm being apologies. told it's Finlay Carson's a bit of a dispute up here. I mustn't get names wrong again, Mr Green. I'll be rebuked by Mr Tompkins. It, it must be the beard, uh, but mine's isn't grey. Um, uh, I forgot what I was going to say now. I, I was, I was clar clarifying, apologies for taking up your time, in that I, I, I'm not questioning that any money spent on this issue. I think it's important that uh, you know, child safety is absolutely paramount. It's a question of, of how that money is implemented. Absolutely. And Mr. I, agree, I agree with that entirely. I'm not questioning that there might be a need for some money if, if, if there are still buses to do that. But I am questioning the amount of money of £8.92 million to be spent on this. Um, it seems odd to me that it's, it's necessary. So, but I have to say I'm supportive of this bill. However, if the aims of the bill have already been achieved, then that should be a real success in itself. And at this point, I have to say I must make comment about a report in this morning's Press and Journal about this bill where I am quoted. This quote is taken from the committee's very first evidence session on the 15th of March, where I questioned the two government officials supporting Gillian Martin's bill. I put it to them and I quote, the bill is purely about the technical aspects of having seat belts fitted. It's not about any other issue related to whether kids are safe traveling to and from school on buses that have seat belts fitted. If we are to take legislation through, we should be comprehensive and attack the potential problem that we all see right across this chamber, rather than go off at half cock with a bill that doesn't cover people's worries. My colleague on the committee, Richard Lyle, then said, the point that Mr. Rumbles and the convener make are quite valid. Who will be liable for enforcement if there is to be any enforcement? Now, in this morning's P&J, Gillian Martin is quoted as saying she was shocked by Mr. Rumbles' stance. Shocked. Uh, I am both relieved and pleased that his words have been met with no support. Listen to the debate. Of course. Gillian Martin. If you read the, the, the whole articles, I'm sure you did, you'll realise that I actually um, received a letter from a very supportive coach company who provides quite a lot of dedicated school transport for Aberdeenshire, um, which obviously you represent as well. And I, th I think they echoed my concerns about, about your approach here. When you were mentioning that you didn't think that it needed, the, the bill needed to go forward because it was going to happen organically already and it was a foregone conclusion. And they wrote in support of, of the fact that this has to be legislated. And I think the shock that I had was shared by them. That, that was a long intervention, Mr. Rumbles. Don't, don't fash yourself. You're getting that extra minute. OK, thank you. Can I just say that um, it's a very strange report that a newspaper reports this two months after the committee is stated. But I have to say, I find it very strange that you took that position. Because what you can hear around the chamber is only what I'm saying is echoing what every other member seems to be saying, that there are issues with this bill. So, you know, um, presenting officer, I, my Liberal Democrat colleague, support Gillian Martin's bill and congratulate her, despite what she said ab about me in the PNG this morning, I congratulate her on the bill. Uh, there is much room for improvement, and that's the whole point of the stage two process and stage three process. I hope she will reflect on the concerns of members ex as expressed in the committee and in this chamber in this debate today and bring amendments to improve the bill because that's what we're talking about. We want this bill to pass, but we want it improved. This is all about the safety of our children and we have to get it right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rumbles. I call Marie Todd. We follow by Alexander Burnett. Mr. Burnett will be the last speaker in the open debate. Ms. Todd, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to start by echoing others um, in offering condolences to the people who were affected by the in last night's events in Manchester and to commend the emergency services for their response. I want to also congratulate Gillian Martin for bringing this bill forward. Before I travelled down last night, 
I was thinking about what to say in today's debate. I've got three children who get the bus to school every day, so I decided to ask them for their thoughts at the dinner table. The first thing I was told was that nobody uses seatbelts. They told me that children get teased for wearing seatbelts on the bus. It's not socially normal to wear a seatbelt. My children would not dream of travelling in a car without wearing a seatbelt, but it turns out they wouldn't dream of wearing a seatbelt on a bus. My dad happened to be down visiting us, and the thought that nobody uses seatbelts even when they were available really got to him. My dad used to be a fireman in Ullapool, part of the retained fire service that covers so much of the Highlands and Islands. He told us about an accident he attended more than 30 years ago when a tour bus went off the road. It had swerved off the road, probably to avoid a sheep or a deer. It landed on its side, and people were thrown free of it because they weren't wearing seatbelts. Unfortunately, the men from Ullapool had no equipment to lift the bus, so all they could do on this occasion was wait for the team from Inverness to arrive and comfort the people involved. Seven people died in that accident, and it was one of the worst my dad attended in his lifetime of service. He was horrified that my children thought that seatbelts weren't needed on a bus. It's a simple truth. Wearing seatbelts can and does save lives. I have no doubt that we as lawmakers should try to ensure that seatbelts are available and that they are used wherever possible. Of course, it's clear that seatbelts and buses aren't always used, even when they are available. And that's an area we need to change the social norm. We need to get to the point where, like in a car, it's unusual not to wear a seatbelt on a bus. I think we'll all acknowledge that no single piece of legislation will change a social norm like this one. But legislation has a role to play. We've seen that legislation has helped to bring about these changes in the past. When I was a child, like Gail Ross, the norm was not to wear a seatbelt in the cars. And that changed incrementally with legislative changes. It wasn't until 1983, when I was 10 years old, that it became law for folk in the front of a car to wear a seatbelt. And even then, seatbelts often weren't fitted in the back of a car. That only became law in 1986. And the law changed to make you use them in 1989. It was pretty common when I was growing up to have five or more kids in the back of your car, none of us wearing seatbelts. When I was really young, my personal favourite spot in the car was standing between the two front seats, chatting to my parents. That was my dad, the fireman, driving. That shows how things can change. That social norm has completely reversed. And frankly, because of developments in technology since this change, we can't not wear seatbelts in the car anymore. Because now if someone isn't wearing their seatbelt, the car beeps endlessly and irritates us into wearing them. I think the questions over how to enforce this law are fair. Bus monitors and technology may both have a role. Ultimately, though, I think the bill is about changing a social norm. In rural areas like the Highlands and Islands, where I represent, there is a much higher risk for children travelling on buses. Often the bus journeys that take kids to school will be significantly longer on roads with higher speed limits in the more urban areas. I think all parents would agree with the Scottish Parent Teacher Council when they stated, the principle of the bill is absolutely right, that when parents send their children off to school and entrust them to a local authority, the local authority is in local parentis. I cannot take my children anywhere in a car without strapping them in, in. It is completely unreasonable to suggest that local authorities should be in any other position. Thank you very much. I now call Alexander Burnett. Then we move to closing speeches. Mr Burnett, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I echo the words of a chamber and send my condolences to those affected by the recent attacks in Manchester? As the Prime Minister said this morning, Britain's spirit has never been broken and never will. Now, on today's debate, can I start by welcoming this bill to the chamber? It is great to see that we are finally starting to debate issues within the jurisdiction of this parliament that can have a positive impact on people's lives. I think we all across the chamber are in no doubt about the unnecessary danger drivers and passengers put themselves in by not wearing a seatbelt. Indeed, it was a Conservative government that made wearing seatbelts law back in 1983. It seems unthinkable today that seatbelts were not compulsory in all vehicles back in the 1980s, and I think we will all look back to school buses with the same feeling in the coming years. This is a vitally important bill that will protect children from serious injury, 
So it is important that we get this right first time. And that is why, on this side of the chamber, we will support the bill in principle. Unfortunately, Ms Martin's bill has severe limitations and some major omissions, as already discussed. Firstly, the bill will only cover school transportation between homes and primary education. Now, anyone who has children at school, including myself, will know that a major part of travelling in education is done... I won't, because there's not enough time. Uh, ..will know that a major part of travelling in education is done outside of these two locations. For example, any after-school curricular activities that, by the way, are now chargeable, thanks to reductions in Sports Scotland funding, will include bus journeys to facilities. So how can it be the case, then, that child safety on the same roads changes depending on where your final destination is? Are we seriously saying that the risk on the same stretch of road can change if you are travelling for a different purpose? That is simply unacceptable and quite ludicrous drafting. A major blunder in the writing of this bill that put passengers at unnecessary risk. So it is no wonder, then, that the Royal Society for Prevention of Accidents were clear in their submission to the consultation that the legislation should apply to all school journeys and I hope that this common sense approach is picked up by the member. Secondly, although the cost for implementing this policy should not be a hindrance, it is vitally important that unlike the Labour Welsh Government, when they brought in similar legislation, extra funding be given to local authorities to carry out the necessary changes. Local authorities in Wales had to fund those costs at a time when council budgets were being cut and Scotland's councils can ill afford the same fate. Now, we know it is normal SNP practice to make promises that others have to pay for, but I think councils across Scotland would like to hear from Ms Martin where they should find this money. But my final point on this policy is on education and the importance of seatbelt usage. Just because the seatbelts are available does not guarantee that pupils will wear them. And that is why I'm glad to see my own council, Aberdeenshire, has a leaflet for parents and pupils on school transport, including a section on the responsibility of each passenger to properly wear a seatbelt at all times. So in summary, Deputy Presiding Officer, I welcome the bill as far as it goes, but it is clear that it has not been properly thought through, and I hope Ms Martin can give consideration to all these points before the next stage. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Burnett. I call Rhoda Grant. Can I ask Ms Grant perhaps to convey to Neil Bibby open for Labour is disappointing not to have the pleasure of his presence at closing speeches. No doubt he'll send an appropriate apology to the presiding officers. Call Rhoda Grant to close for Labour, please. Um, thank you. And can I also congratulate Gillian Martin for bringing forward the legislation and associate myself with some of the comments people made um, about the difficulty of this debate, especially today. But I think Debating ch ch children's safety today is probably our best response. Um, and protecting children as they travel to school is something that we can all agree on. And there was very little argument about the general principles of the bill. Um, and like many others, Mike, Mike Rumble said, uh, why has it taken so long to have this legislation for school buses because we've had legislation um, for cars and it's been a lifesaver and we've built and improved on that uh, with baby seats and booster seats and it must be very strange for children to have this level of protection in their family car but none in school um, transport so it was not opposition to the bill that we debated but some of um, the issues surrounding it and some of those issues were about the limitations of the bill, as many members have said, um, that it was simply on, dedicated to school buses alone, um, those that took uh, children back and forth to school, but it does not cover school trips and children using public transport to get there. And my colleague, Neil Bibby, suggested that it should have gone a lot further, maybe along the lines of the Welsh bill. There were also concerns that the bill, while ensuring that school buses had seatbelts on them, there was nothing in the bill to say whose responsibility it was to make sure that children wore those seatbelts. And while in normal circumstances it would be the driver's responsibility, that is obviously impossible when driving a school bus and checking seatbelts at the same time. Daniel Johnston and many other members echoed that it didn't go far enough and it stra seems strange that a bill chewed seatbelts to travel to and from school but not for organised school trips and the Scottish Government's response 
to that was a bit disappointing, seeing that there was more rigorous risk assessments taking place uh, for school trips than there were for normal school transport. Um, we need to address, I think, in, in stage two, whose responsibility it is um, to wear the seat belts. Neil Bibby pointed out that neither uh, was it a responsibility for someone to ensure that the seat belts were worn, but actually there was nothing in the bill to say the seat belts should be worn at all. Liam Kerr talked about behaviour on school buses, and we, um, looking back to my own school days, I know what um, behaviour on school buses used to be like, but we had evidence to say that um, young people now have smartphones and they're not so much creating a riot on the school bus as sitting texting probably someone who's sitting a couple of seats up and the like. Um, we asked about the Scottish. We asked the Scottish government about council's role in local parents and their duty of care about wearing the seat belts, and they acknowledged that councils did have a duty of care, but said it would be for the courts to decide if they were liable if a child was inter injured because they didn't have their seat belt on. And I don't think that is good enough. Councils, parents, and pupils need to know whose responsibility is that is. So I think again. At stage two, we need to have some clarity. We also heard from the Youth Parliament that it was not something that they would like to see done to young people, that young people should be encouraged to be proactive, that young people should be educated and informed about the benefits of wearing their own seatbelts from a very early age. And that way there would be no need for supervision because they would take their own, they would deal with their own safety proactively. And a lot of members talked about, um, Marie Todd, for instance, talked about changing the social no norms. We've seen that happen in the past, and I think it can happen again in the future. Uh, many members talked about, is the bill required at all? And nobody is against the general principles of the bill, but it was clear from evidence that the majority of councils had already made the provision for seatbelts on school buses, a stipulation of their tender documents. Um, and those that hadn't done it were working towards it. And therefore, it's likely that all councils will have stipulated this requirement in their contracts prior to this bill even being enacted. So that was where the call from for whether it was required at all came from. There was also concerns about the financing of the bill in the financial memorandum. Daniel Johnston talked about £80,000 per bus. I mean, that was a figure that was new to us, but it kind of does sum up the concerns that we heard at committee about the cost of it. So often I've seen in this parliament where we've been looking at financial memorandums, underestimating the financial um, cost of a bill rather than overestimating it estimating it so it's a new one on me presiding officer there's widespread support for the principles of this bill but it may not be required at all but i look forward maybe in stage two and stage three strengthening it to make it um, a better bill that will make a real difference to our young people thank you very much Ms. grant i call on liz smith to close the conservatives please thank you uh, deputy presiding officer and many members this afternoon have spoken about the poignancy of debating this uh, bill uh, today and I don't think we should forget that it also comes hard on the heels of a lot of the debate that we've had about the safety of school buildings because it just reinforces exactly why parents have a right to think that their child will always be safe and that their parliamentarians will always be guardians uh, of that principle. But I come to this uh, as uh, in a slightly different manner as somebody who is a very regular driver of school minibuses and who has seen all the improvements that have taken place in school transport since the 1980s when I first secured my minibus license. But while virtually all these changes have been very much welcomed, uh, progress has been, as uh, Daniel Johnson cited in the debate, uh, somewhat gradual. And so it's very important that this uh, debate this afternoon takes place to ensure that all that school transport and all children are safe. And I thank Gillian uh, Martin in that context because I think it's made us think very carefully about exactly what we mean. And, and to Stuart Stevenson too, who I think uh, posed the question about what the importance uh, and the rationale is of when we want to legislate. And in placing a duty on our local authorities to ensure that a seat belt is fitted to every passenger seat and every motor vehicle that's used to provide a dedicated school transport service, there is the presumption, obviously, that there would be a universal requirement backed by law to make the necessary changes. And in that regard, that's why the Scottish Conservatives, like other members here, have been supportive of the bill in its principle. And we also believe 
uh, that it has important benefits in terms of educating children about the importance of wearing seatbelts. I think uh, Marie Todd gave us uh, a very uh, special reminder of just what it can mean uh, when circumstances dictate that there could be very considerable danger if these seatbelts are not worn. Presiding officer, notwithstanding the fact that we do have uh, that support for the main principles, we do have some uh, concerns about the basic provisions of the bill um, as we consider that perhaps it hasn't been thought through on some key points. First among these uh, is that the bill should go much further when it covers uh, school excursions, not just on daily commutes between uh, home and school. And again, I come back to the point as somebody who drives a school minibus, um, I, I would be very concerned if I felt that um, the circumstances in which I'm driving children had slightly different safety requirements, um, simply because I wasn't taking them uh, to and from their school. And I, I just want to uh, outline that as where I think there is a major concern about this, because under the definition uh, of an educational excursion, it's my understanding that this bill would not cover that. And therefore, if pupils are going to undertake extracurricular activities, which we obviously hope that they will do, um, either before or at the end of the school day, my understanding of the legislation is that's not covered by local authority legislation because it's not core provision in education. And I think um, perhaps the Scottish Government should look again uh, at the, the method by which the Scottish Government's own road safety consultation is seeking to make the adjustments in that because I think, it, it, again, it's something that we would have to ensure that this bill um, was compliant with that legislation. Otherwise, I think we're in danger of getting ourselves into a circumstance where we would have uh, some problems. Now, I'm grateful to uh, John Mason uh, for explaining his concern about the extent uh, of the uh, costings of that. And I think um, in light of what Mike Rumble said and uh, one or two other members this afternoon, I think we have to be very clear not only about what the costs are, but the modelling of these costs, because I would be much more comfortable if I felt that we could get the right information. And Minister, I think you're going to agree to look into that in a bit more detail and provide us with some additional information that, quite frankly, I think we ought to be able to have at stage one. Now, another point that I want to address very quickly is that while the bill specifies what the responsibility would be of grant aid in independent schools, I think there is greater clarity that we have to have about special schools transport, uh, since that's very often used to carry children whose schools have different governance structures. In other words, special uh, schools uh, might have independent governance. They might also be used by local authorities. And I think there would be a big question uh, over where liability uh, rose on some of that. And of course, they're using very technical um, equipment, technical wheelchairs that can be used by children who are attending a grant-aided or an independent school, but also by children who are attending local authority. And if, if I was driving that uh, minibus, I, I would want to know where the responsibility lay for that. And I'm not sure that that has actually been explained. Now, I know my time is up, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, but we are very keen on the basic principles of this bill. But we do have quite a few concerns about thinking it through to make it compliant with other legislation, but also to look at what the opportunities might be for ensuring that we cover all the um, possible loopholes, which I think are actually quite considerable. Thank you very much, uh, Ms Smith. I call on Hamza Youssef to close the government. Mr Youssef. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Thank you to those who have contributed uh, in the Chamber. I think a very constructive debate, uh, very helpful, very useful. Uh, and, and that is, of course, the purpose of, of such debates, to uh, highlight concerns uh, where uh, members who are taking these bills forward or if government is taking the bills forward to come back with uh, more robust evidence uh, with uh, considering other uh, perhaps uh, uh, issues uh, around the bill as well. So I'm going to try to do my best to whiz through some of the issues. But there's been actually some key themes, uh, I think, mentioned by almost every member uh, across this chamber and see if I can uh, address some, some of those. Uh, in relation to um, why this legislation is important, I thought Liam Kerr uh, kind of asked, asked that question. Mike Rumbles uh, also uh, on that theme that councils are moving towards uh, this many councils, of course, already implementing uh, seat belts as a stipulation in their contracts for school transport. I will just reiterate that point that although that may be the case, we still have a number of councils that aren't there. Just for Mike Rumble's uh, information, we have 18 councils. That still remains the figure. Six who have said, uh, looking at some of the provisions, uh, namely those six being Dundee City Council, East Lothian Council, Orkney Islands Council, West Lothian, Renfrewshire uh, and Western Bartonshire. But I would 
add uh, the appropriate caveat, the obvious one that, of course, we've just had local uh, elections uh, and new administrations perhaps coming in in some of these areas, new leadership. Again, I don't imagine that they would roll back uh, on their commitment or desire uh, to see school uh, seatbelts fitted, fitted on school transport, but uh, just to say that those are the latest figures that we have. But it is important that we do future-proof uh, as, as well when it comes to this important legislation. Um, I thought this, uh, as I said, this uh, debate was uh, very constructive. One of the other key themes that came across from members across the chamber um, was uh, on uh, school trips uh, as well. So I welcome very much the views expressed in the chamber today on whether the me measure should cover vehicles used for excursions during the school uh, day. Liz Smith just mentioning that in her uh, speech uh, a moment ago. I did not know that she had a minibus licence. Next time we have a Parliament day out, we know who will be driving the bus. Um, but as I said, th there are stringent uh, risk assessment guidelines uh, covering the provision which stipulates seatbelts and feedback uh, is that this is rigidly adhered to. However, in principle, I see uh, no objection with the, the intention uh, of uh, legislating further in terms of school trips as many members uh, across the Chamber and having had discussions with Ms Martin, I'm sure she'll speak for herself in, in a moment, of course, uh, she's also uh, favourably uh, minded uh, as well. So therefore, Scottish Government officials have been in touch with teaching unions, uh, with local government and other stakeholders to ascertain uh, what the practical implications would be of extending the legal duty in this area. Uh, we'll take that dialogue forward and of course, uh, Parliament will be uh, kept uh, appropriately informed. On the issue of enforcement and, and compliance, uh, the requirement to publish an annual compliance statement in the public domain, uh, such as on a website or a report before a council committee, uh, offers transparency uh, but also remains proportionate. Uh, there are, of course, already established recourse, recourse mechanisms which are applicable uh, to the legal duty, such as a uh, referral to the SPSO, uh, which has confirmed it has remit to investigate this issue in relation to local authority schools uh, and for civil legal action in the event that there's been a failure uh, to comply. So given that stipulating seatbelts is already seen as good practice for school authorities and there are clear precedents for how this is implemented and works in practice, those measures should be uh, proportionate. Councils take those... Yes, of course. Ms Smith, for him taking that intervention, would he agree in that discussion that he will have to look at where the liability would lie, um, particularly with uh, schools that would obviously have different governance structures, because it, it's my information that that could be a potential problem. Minister? Yeah. I was ju just uh, coming to that very, very point that uh, I thought uh, the point made about independent schools, grant funded uh, and aided uh, schools, that there is a, an issue, a question there that uh, we will come back to and we will examine, we will explore. I think it's a point well made by uh, Liz Smith and also one that we're cognizant of, one that we're aware of, of uh, on this side uh, of the chamber uh, as well. Uh, one of the other key significant themes uh, that came out of today's debate from members across the chamber uh, was that uh, of course, uh, just a few things if I, if I may say, we've heard what the committee had to say on this, we've heard uh, what those across the chamber have had to say about this and therefore uh, we have uh, uh, written to COSLA uh, to have a discussion with them to see if we can get a, a more robust um, case around some of the finances involved. I would say uh, to members that it is not quite as simple as dividing how much money exists divided by the number of vehicles, 110, that still require uh, that fitting, fitting. Of course I will. Quickly. Daniel Johnson, please. I, I think Ms. very much for giving way. I mean, does he recognise that, that figure of 110 buses? And he's saying it's not as simple as that. Could he say why it's not as simple as that? And actually, what, what explorations has he made to look at whether or not there might be some sort of direct grant uh, possibilities to just make sure these old buses, pre-2001 buses, are up to spec? Minister, you have an extra minute. Oh, thank you. Uh, yes, I will tell him why it's necessarily not as simple. Um, you know, given that vehicles on the main, of course, provided through contracts, uh, with the private sector, there's a range of commercial influences that might be considered, for example, in an area of more rurality or different ge geographical uh, areas across the country. There may not be the, uh, as much provision for a uh, private provider as there would be, for example, in an urban setting, setting in Edinburgh and Glasgow, uh, perhaps uh, easier to get private contractors as there would be in, uh, in more remote areas. So this idea that a linear formula can be uh, applied would be incorrect, but not to say that the member doesn't make a good point, as other members have across uh, the parliamentary chamber, those costs must be tested, that we must examine them, we must explore them uh, and give them further analysis. It should be said that uh, if I have the time to do so. John Mason. I think the 
Thank you for giving way. I mean, the, the financial memorandum itself, paragraph 29, says that the cost of retrofitting would be between 2,000 and 12,500 per bus. So it's not the same figures, but they are pretty clear figures. Minister. Uh, I would thank the member for all his uh, helpful contributions. Uh, what I would say that they... <laughs> I, I said that with all sincerity. Um, they are estimated the cost at 202,000 per year from 2018 rising incrementally to 765 per year to 2021, costing this amount uh, annually until 2031. So that's the context of, of the cost envelope. It should be said, this also comes within the, the cost envelope uh, that independent consultants gave us as well. The Minister for Transport uh, and Islands, previous Minister uh, for Transport and Islands, uh, when, we, when we took this bill forward, uh, we, we, we took the services of independent consultants and it is within that framework. However, uh, let me not take away from what members have said, be it John Mason, uh, Daniel Johnson, uh, the convener uh, of the committee, uh, Liz Smith, Mike Rumbles, uh, and indeed John Finney himself uh, uh, as well, has said that they all have concerns around the financial memorandum. So therefore, we will work with COSLA. We will see what can be done. Uh, I would encourage COSLA, uh, once they are, of course, up and running, new administrations in place, new spokespeople in place, to engage with the committee directly uh, as well. And hopefully we can uh, get to some uh, final position where everybody is comfortable with the financial memorandum. Uh, in closing, I would just like to thank uh, the committee in particular for their consideration, uh, but also for Ms Martin for taking friends. forward this bill. Uh, and also for the members for agreeing across the chamber to support it uh, at stage one. Thank you. I call the member, Gillian Martin, to close and give you till 4.57, please, Ms Martin, or thereabouts. Thank you, President Officer. Well, this has been an interesting debate, and I think we can all agree that the provision of seatbelts in all school transport is necessary and desirable. Um, we all want to do the best thing for Scotland's young people and to keep them safe on their way to school. Um, I just want to say, as a, as a relatively new MSP, taking forward their first, hopefully, to become legislation, um, I want to thank everyone across the chamber who has spoken to me over the months and weeks about this. I've had some tremendous support from people from all parties over this and some, some great chats about their experience in their areas as well, which has really informed uh, my, my thinking on this as, as I've taken it forward. I particularly want to mention that Dave Stewart from the Labour benches had a, a great chat with him, Jamie Green from the Conservative benches and, and, and Tavish Scott when I, was look, when, I was, when I was hanging about in the, the members' tea room trying to get people to sign up to it in the first place. Um, can, I also can I also recommend that tactic if you ever take a member's bill forward? Um, this bill, I have I over, also been overwhelmed by the amount of public support that it's got. And, and I echo uh, Daniel Johnson's point that more or less everyone that I've spoken to has said the same thing that Daniel said to me in the garden lobby that day. I thought this was already law. And it turns out that because so, you know, quite a few local authorities are doing it already, that there's an expectation that it's been done across Scotland. Um, and I think that's the issue here. You know, for those of us that are lucky enough to have their local authority already been way ahead of the curve on this and looking at this on a voluntary basis. I think it's incumbent upon those of us that have enjoyed that peace of mind when we put our kids on the school bus um, that have seat belts to think, well, you know, that, that's, that, that, that's luck that I live here, you know? Um, so I think it's incumbent upon those that, that do have that peace of mind to, to work to get it across the whole of Scotland. Um, I want to thank the committee uh, in particular for very constructive comments. I mean, school trips has come up quite a lot in the debate, as I, as I expected, because it came up quite a lot in the committee too. Um, and uh, although there are rigorous uh, risk assessments in place with school trips, um, I want to make sure that it's forward. I absolutely am 100% behind looking at this and putting in as an amendment at, at stage two. But it's important that we speak to, as we did around the, the, the singular issue of having seatbelts fitted on school buses, it's important that we get engagement again, just to let teachers... Yes? Elizabeth. Make the point that the risk assessment is not normally anything that has got legislative backing to it. Julian Martin. Well, what I was going to say is it's important that with this coming into the, the, as a possible amendment that explore the issues that you've mentioned around that as well, um, because obviously that's been, enforcement's obviously had a, a, a bearing on the bill as it stands. 
um, but also to get the, the, the feedback from teachers and from teaching unions on this as well, um, just, to, just to find out their thoughts on it. And it, so far, they have largely been very supportive. Um, I do have to, uh, Alec, Alec Barnett, um, I, I tried to intervene you just to correct you slightly on something that you said. You said that the bill only covers primary schools. That's actually not the case. I just want to put it on record that it does already cover both primary and secondary schools. Um, I want to, the, sta the, standout, the standout contribution for me was Marie Todd because I think we're of a similar age. Um, and she was talking about the practices of kids in the, I, did I say 70s, Marie? Where, where you, you were travelling in your parents' car, you weren't belted on the top, there's no seatbelts in the back. Oh, actually, I'm old enough to remember there not been seatbelts in the front seats either. Um, um, Never. Yes, I know. Um, <laughs> And now it's unthinkable, it's absolutely unthinkable that you wouldn't get into a car and just automatically put your seatbelt on the front seat. And I remember them coming in in the back seat as well. And yes, there was a period of time where you had to sort of remind the kids to put their belts on in the back seat. But you don't have to do that anymore. And the teenagers that we've mentioned that said it's uncool to wear seatbelts in, in buses, they wouldn't think twice about putting seatbelts on in the back seat of cars now. So. It would be terrific to have the powers to say that we have to, to make it law. We don't have those powers, but we do have the opportunity to educate um, more young people about the importance of having seatbelts on and buses as well. And I have to say, I, I come from this as well, having a, a friend who is a, a head trauma specialist. And um, she's told me many times of, of the effects of car accidents when, when people have suffered head trauma. And uh, the whole time that I've been taking this bill forward, I've been very cognizant of some of the stuff she's told me about. Um, you know, this is not just about cuts and grazes. Um, it could be about something an awful lot more serious. Um, I want to pick up on some of the comments that some of the members have made around uh, particularly the implementation of this. We have, in my area, a lot of road safety issues. It's a very rural area, and we constantly are working with our teenagers to make them aware of road safety. Uh, a lot of you have probably heard of Safe Drive, Stay Alive, for example. Um, Aberdeenshire Council and the, the, their schools have really done a fantastic job in getting the pupils in secondary to have that kind of almost um, knee jerk, go onto a bus, put the belts on. It's been out, and they've, what they've done is they've worked with the pupils so that this becomes the norm. And one of the ways they've done it is by um, having senior pupils on the bus take responsibility for just ch double checking that the younger children are putting on the buses. And it's something that they, they do with, uh, with like year heads and, and, and uh, head boy, head girl, etc., And prefects, I suppose, that they used to be called. And that's one of the, the things that we were putting the guidance as an option. Some people have mentioned about bus monitors as well. Now, some local authorities do insist on bus monitors, but and this comes back to what Daniel was asking me about, uh, Daniel Johnson was asking me about um, why some things can be counterproductive. Well, in some cases, we've actually heard that by having a bus monitor on a bus, that can almost be counterproductive. For some areas, they've found that the uh, school children have almost rebelled against the bus monitor. But another, another thing is it's often not suitable for very long journeys, like in rural areas as well, to have somebody perhaps been in a bus from half past five in the morning to get to an outlying area and then coming in, so it's really not be. So that's one of the reasons why I don't want to be too heavy-handed in what we stipulate that, that local authorities must do. We've got to be able to give the flexibility to each local authority to actually decide what's right for them in partnership with the schools and take on board what they would want. There's nothing stopping local authorities from putting in extra measures. Um, P Peter Chapman said this is a bill that's impossible to be against. Um, I'm, Peter and I have gone up against each other many times in political uh, debates and, and it's great to hear that we've finally have said something that you kind of agree with. So that's a, 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 personal, a, a personal achievement of mine. I, I will go away with a skip and, and my step. Um, we, we, we absolutely have to uh, count, uh, 
we have to, to pay tribute as well to the people who went to the, the petitions committee. Um, Stuart Stevenson, my, my friend and colleague, mentioned Ron Beattie. Ron Beattie came to see me as I was putting forward this bill in initial stages, and I thought he was going to give me a row about everything that it wasn't. And I was preparing myself for that because I know what a vociferous campaigner he's been for all types of road safety. But actually, he just wanted to say thanks and he wanted to say that it was a step in the right direction although of course being Mr Beattie not all the steps that he would have liked and I was glad to have had that chance to meet him before his uh, untimely death and again we've, we've had uh, um, Lynn Merrifield has been mentioned by, by my friend and colleague Gail Ross as well who initially came up with the idea that we should have seatbelts on dedicated school transport. Um, how much time have I got, presiding officer? It's really time to wind up now, yeah. Ms Martin. Well, that's great, because I have really don't have much else to say other than... <laughs> <laughs> other than... What comes across loud and clear is that seatbelts help protect children, and many people are surprised that there aren't a lot in this already. And these opinions are reflected by the views of the general public to the Scottish Government's consultation. Um, well, I think now the, the, the Scottish Parliament has the powers to act on this, there will be quite rightly an expe expectation that we get on and take action on this. And in my view, it would be, rem it would be remiss of us not to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that concludes our stage one debate on the seatbelts on School Transport Scotland Bill. It's now time to move on to the next item of business. And